Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, the Science of Learning and uh, today's class. Uh, my name is Nelly Deutsch. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me, if you could just add in the chat box where you're coming from. It's um, very, very cold where I am. Um, if you could just share where you are and uh, what the weather is like, where you're sitting or anything else that you'd like to add about where you are so we can get a better picture. You can see where I am, um, but right now technology won't allow all of us to have our webcams open. But if you do um, have your webcam set and you've checked with IQ and your mics, I'd love to hear you and, uh, and see you. So that's something that you might want to uh, set up for yourself so that um, we can all uh, get to know one another a bit better uh, in, the, uh, in the course. Of course, the course is uh, teaching with technology, and you might wonder, well, how is that connected to the science of learning? Really, Nelly. Um, so if you have any questions before we get started, or comments, feel free to use the chat box. The chat box is really a way to uh, stay focused and to um, and to learn together. As um, friends and colleagues and people who are interested, like-minded people interested in um, similar topics. So we've got Tom from Venezuela, and he says the connection is slow today, and it's been... <laughs> Oh, there was a blackout. I'm sorry to hear that. In all of Venezuela? Um, that sounds scary. If it's the whole, if it's a national blackout day. Uh, people will be coming in as we go. You may welcome them. Oh my Serious, Tom. It reminds me of um, something that happened like that in the New York area many years ago. And it also affected Toronto. So we've got Jim from East Tian Mountains. Is that Tennessee? Sorry for being an ignorant Canadian, even though we did study more um, of American geography than anything. Oh, it is. Okay, great. And we've got Macedonia. Hello, Marisha. Glad to see you here. I know you're in the um, Moodle for teachers course. So it's good to see um, many of you here. That's great. Okay, learning, and I see uh, Iwana is here as well. Actually, I think I know everybody. Richard, if you could just tell us where you're from, and then I'll try to figure out if it's, I know so many Richards. Uh, so we've got Richard living in Mexico, but originally from the UK. All right. Or no, UK Virgin Island. Wow. All right. Never had anyone from there before, as far as I know. That's great. And we've got Jane. Hello, Jane. And Lila. Good. All right. So if you could welcome everyone as they come in. The Science of Learning is uh, based on a book, even though it's more than a book, of course. Uh, applying the Science of Learning by, and uh, there it is, Richard E. Meyer. It's a very thin book. I don't know if that'll tell you how thin it is, but it's really, really thin. It's not a heavy book. It's actually a really great book. I don't know why it's that expensive. It's I think uh, Susan Dixon wrote that it's $57, which is kind of, it is expensive um, for people in certain countries especially. Um, but there's also a place. Uh, John Hopkins University has a Science of Learning website, which is absolutely amazing. And I'd like to share the link with you. Uh, you'll be able to go there. I'm going to be speaking about them. There's a lot of information there. I believe I added it in the course, but if I didn't. There it is again. Lots of information there on learning. Hi, who's that? Karen. Hi, Karen. Good to see you. Um, thank you. If, if you say hi, Nelly, I'll, uh, you know, my eyes go there, but it's an I. It used to be Y, actually. Uh, but when I finished high school, I decided that I didn't like the Y, and I would change it to IE. 
So it's actually a Y. Um, you know, as teachers, we sometimes forget. Um, and I'd like to ask you, did you ever study anything about learning, the psychology of learning, they used to call it? Anything about learning, if you give me thumbs up, thumbs down. Because I think these days, not much uh, focus is put on the actual process of learning and what happens. Oh, great, Marisha. Wonderful. What happens to the learners? You know, what research is out there and how can we apply it in the classroom, specifically in the uh, classroom where we also use technology, but only in the last three years, Tom says. All right, uh, we're going to also look at Daniel Goldman. Um, what do you know about Daniel Goldman? Anyone? Daniel Goldman? I feel like he's a close friend because I... Uh, I'm constantly listening to his talks. He's a wonderful speaker. He didn't do much research. He has his uh, undergrad. I think he also did his master's in psychology. But most of his work is based on someone else's work. And he's finally giving credit to Richard Davidson, who's still doing a lot of work. Social intelligence, that's right, multiple intelligences, just to help you, MI. And he got all his ideas, of course, from uh, the research done by Richard Davidson. All right, we're also going to talk a little bit about Bloom's Taxonomy. And before we get started, clean up. Um, so if you could close your windows and just leave one window... Uh, and if you have any problems during the session, please contact at wizIQ.com, support at wizIQ.com. I can't really help you from this end, but there is an amazing link that tells you how to clean your system so that you can get the most out of uh, your internet connection. If you're using an iPad, Android, tablet, iPhone, and so on, your connection will probably be a lot better. And I'm hoping that in the future we'll go into that kind of technology because right now the internet is not too happy with virtual classes. It seems to drain the system. All right, science of learning. Feel free to use the chat, as I said, for questions. And here we go. KWHL. What does it stand for? This is one of my favorite uh classroom techniques to get students involved in uh, the learning. I believe in uh, question-based, inquiry-based learning. KWHL. I did this in high school when I was teaching high school. I now do it with my adult students. Uh, I do it myself. And in fact, I've been doing this since I was four years old. Uh, and most children do this. Okay, most children go around doing this. They don't need me to tell them to do it. But as we get older, uh, we lose some of that natural curiosity that we have as youngsters. The K stands for, yes, uh, thank you, Brian. What do I know? And generally what I know is knowledge. Okay, it's at the lowest level. And how do we feel about information? Remember that most of the things that we care about are tangible and we can measure them. So we're very happy with information. It makes us feel good. Ah, I know this and I know that because we can measure it. And that's how we feel um, that we know something or somebody tells us, oh, you're really smart. You know, you have a lot of information. But is that everything? And we'll get to uh, Maslow and um, the higher values that are not measurable and are intangible, and we can't really see them. Okay, so we're getting away from that. Uh, we're beginning to realize that not everything that we see is what we really see, and there's a lot more 
to uh, who we are than the tangible things. The W stands for what do I want to know? And this is important because you get information and then you want to, you want more. So what do I want to know? And then how do I find it? And as I said, children have no problems with this. They go to their parents, they go to experts. Uh, as they get older, they may check the library or check the internet these days, but they'll get the information. And then what have I learned? So this is a systematic way of uh, getting our students involved in the content and getting them to experience uh, an exploratory kind of engagement. I don't call it learning because, well, what is learning? When we talk about the science of learning, what do you know about learning? Notice I'm not talking about studying. I'm not talking about memorizing. I'm talking about learning, but maybe it's a combination of everything. So, what is learning? Okay, what do you know about it? Pathway to knowledge. That reminds me of a history book that I had in grade school called Pathways to History. Yes, lots of information in that book. Okay, Brian says, oh, you've got six seconds. That's great. Where did you find that? Wow, emotional. Um, you know, I've been involved <laughs> with uh, six seconds for years. It's, it must be over 15 years. And, and the man behind it is absolutely amazing. Um, I've been trying to get him to speak at one of the online conferences, but he's so busy and so involved. And he's doing amazing things with it. Uh, yes, to see, hello and welcome. Haven't seen you for a while. Yes, understanding. You know, when we understand something, we feel that we know it. So learning is understanding. Okay, but is this something that you picked up somewhere or is this how you feel? Okay, and we'll get to feeling and learning. Reorganize this. Okay, Think of how you feel about learning. What is learning? And I'm touching my heart. What is learning for you? <laughs> oh, thank you, Richard. Applying information or knowledge. Okay. Applying it in some way. And think of how you apply it on a daily basis. You know, we're not really aware of what learning is. It just happens to us and we take it for granted. But we are learning all the time, or we're experiencing something. Uh, but our awareness is not really part of it, and we'll talk about that as well today, about being conscious of learning. And you know, often your students will tell you, I don't understand anything. I'm not learning anything. Okay, and that's a that's something that we need to relate to. What does it mean? I'm not learning anything. Right, this is an amazing book. I just got a tweet from um, Frank Partnoy. There is the book. If you get a chance to read it, or if you like to drive and listen, there's audibles. That's how I live. I just sometimes I go out just to listen to um, Audible. Audible is Amazon. It belongs to Amazon, and it, you can get. A lot of the books that I've showed you um, through Audible on your iPhone, your iPad, and so on, it's, it's absolutely amazing because it allows you to read the book, listen to the book uh, in multiple ways, and, and, and gain so much. This book has led me, uh, Frank Portnoy is actually a journalist, and journalists like uh, Dan, not Dan, yes, uh, Daniel Goldman. Uh, who's also, he turned journalist, are amazing authors because they know how to conduct research. I don't know. They're just amazing. And uh, 
they lead you from one to the other and their books are written in, in amazing ways. Uh, journalists, amazing writers, uh, the dog. Yes, that's the idea. The idea is that how long do you think the dog will wait? Okay, how long? This is a true story, by the way, 30 seconds. The dog will wait as long as the dog was trained to wait. In other words, you can be trained to wait. And there's a great deal of value in waiting, which means that we can learn by waiting. Okay, wait a minute. Do you want the information now? Wait. Waiting is a process. It, it helps you become aware of what's going on around you. It forces you to stop. Okay, and those of you who've done meditations and who do sitting uh, meditations understand what it means to stop. We can't continuously bombard our brains. Okay, we need to stop. Take a look and observe. Just like the dog. Dogs can do it better than we can. They can wait if they're going to get something. Most of us are on the rush. And they say that time is actually um, a killer for all of us because, you know, why are we doing everything around the clock? You get up in the morning, not because you want to get up in the morning and because it's a beautiful day and the sun's out or it's, it's a rainy day and you want to walk in the rain or there's snow out there and you want to appreciate the snow. Um, you get up in the morning because you have to go to work or you have to this, have to, have to, have to, have to. You have to do all these things. So time is actually a boss who tells you how to live, what to do, when to do it, okay? So it takes away our freedom. <laughs> Hurry sickness, yes, Jim. It takes away our freedom, basically. Now I enjoy life. That's wonderful, uh, Tom. I'm glad to hear that. But we don't have to retire in order to slow down and wait. We can do it while we're rushing, as long as we don't think about rushing. So there's a way to get around this. And the time actually helps us organize our lives, okay? It's a way to organize, and that's why time is such a, I mean, the clock is such a wonderful thing, and time, which is something that we made up, actually. What is better for learning? What kind of environment? An organized or a messy one? If you had to choose, what would you choose? Uh, messy is this. Okay, there is the devil. Messy is the devil. Orderly is the perfect smile. There we go. So what do you prefer? Messy, the devil, or organized? Okay. And then think about your brain. How does your brain process information? Does it process it in an organized way? Do you get your information? And I'm not talking about school information, but do we get our information in an organized way? Does the brain say, okay, is it organized or is it messy the way we're bombarded with information? Okay, think about it and you feel free to uh, respond. Neuroscience is fascinating. It sure is, Brian. And Richard, if you're interested, uh, Richard Davidson is the man. <laughs> Rich, he doesn't get much credit for the work that he does. Other people get credit. Um, and I think he deserves it. He's just an amazing scientist, actually psychologist. Richard Davidson. Um, 
Carl Jung, for those of you who've heard of him, says that in all chaos, there is a cosmos. And all disorder is a secret order. In all disorder, there is a secret order. And I think that tells it all. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That's right. And that's the idea here. So disorder, chaos, is life. It's not organized. Nothing is organized. Nothing is known in advance. Uh, things happen. Life happens. As Alan Watts, if you'd like a brilliant... Too bad he's dead. <laughs> he died in 73, I believe. Alan Watts is an amazing... Anybody know Alan Watts? Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. Alan Watts. He says it all. Ah, uh, Jim, you know, I, I figured you would. <laughs> okay. An amazing, amazing he was. But you can still listen to him. You'll find him on YouTube. Great ideas about the truth. Okay, no lies. The truth as it is. This is an example of MOOCs and the Science of Learning. Okay, created by uh, lots of people here. You can see Berkman and Justin Wright. And, and look at it. Does it look organized? So how do you feel about this? If you like it, thumbs up. If you don't like it, thumbs down. If you can't put your thumbs up or down, then just say up, down. If you can, if you're on a tablet, I think you can't do it yet. We're on the WizIQ iPhone apps, which is amazing. Okay, so you see it's mixed. I don't like it because I don't like the colors, personally. I, uh, I don't like the black. I don't like the green. I don't like that, you know, yellowish green. I go for colors. You know, give me brilliant colors and I'll feel comfortable. How do you feel about this? Okay, here is... A, an eclipse, biology and psychology, memory, how do you feel about this? Okay, thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm not sure if my thumb is up or down. I'm not sure about this, but so there's, okay, I see uh, thumbs up. Yeah, okay, what makes it, it's clear, okay, thank you, Brian. Yes, notice here, I don't know what you're looking at. If you're looking at the words or the color, okay, there is going from the individual to the collective. There's memory, storage, priming, culture. Yeah, it does make sense, okay? We can, what's the word? We can relate to it. Someone said relate. What other words would you say? It makes sense, right? Okay, but we don't know if that's learning or not. All right, so how do we learn? According to Richard Davidson, one of my favorite people, an amazing psychologist, neuroscientist, uh, Brian. Um, okay, there, the emotional life of your brain. Did you know that your cognition, the reasoning part of your brain, goes with your emotions? They're connected. In fact, what comes before any kind of emotion, I think I mentioned this before, what comes first, thinking or feeling? Let's see what you say. The chicken, <laughs> no. No, this, <laughs> not the chicken or the egg. There is a logical, according to, they have research. It's research-based. They conducted research. And not just uh, Richard Davidson, but others have also conducted research on this. And this is where Daniel Goldman got all his ideas from his good friend, Richard Davidson, even though Richard's a bit younger. You get it 
first thing that happens is thinking. According to the research, first of all, there's thinking, and then there is emotions. You cannot have emotions unless you think about it first. You will not feel until you think first. You cannot be depressed, as uh, Richard Carlston says here, and this is based on the psychology of mind, which is amazing. And Richard Carlson, who died in an airplane crash a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, Carlson was an amazing, um, also psychologist. He based all his work on the psychology of mind. You first think negative thoughts, and then you feel them. You first think, I'm depressed, and then you feel depressed. You first think, I love that woman, or I love that man, and then you feel it. Thoughts precede emotions or moods. Uh, moods are a bit different because moods come and go. We have no way of knowing why they come. But emotions come as a result of thinking. Observing is the great way to do this. Because when you observe, you're actually not thinking and not feeling. Okay, observing, as Tom mentioned, is neutral. If, you know, if we don't think, if you just observe, you are being neutral, which is what they do in meditations. You just observe, you do not think, or if you think you don't take your thoughts seriously, uh, you come back to the breathing, to your body and so on, and then you don't get into the emotions because emotions are very confusing. And so is thinking, because thinking is not reality. It's just thoughts. So how do we learn? A combination of thinking and feeling. Okay, that's a big part of it, as Richard Davidson. And this man, have you heard of um, the happiest man on earth? His name is, oh, I took away his name. <laughs> Anybody know his name? It's Picard. <sighs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. That's right. Richard Davidson. Uh, Picard. Anybody hear of Picard? If you look for the happiest man in the world, you'll get Matthew Picard. Ricard, sorry. Matthew Ricard. An amazing human being. There, let me share the link of the Wikipedia about him. He's everywhere. And Richard Davidson uh, took a few um, meditators. He wanted to show that meditation can help learning. In other words, if you're in a relaxed state, you're able to process a lot more uh, and retain information when you're relaxed. Everybody knows that it makes sense. But Richard Davidson actually conducted research, and he wanted to find out if meditation could also change our state of being. And it turned out <laughs> that uh, Picard, uh, Matthew Picard, who's originally from France, he's a biologist, uh, he's, he's a doctor of biology um, and the sciences, but he's been a Buddhist for many, many years, I think maybe over 40 years. And it turned out that he indeed is, it's research-based, the happiest man on earth. And he's brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. I don't know if there's a question there. Put a question mark. I see here, I agree. To what criteria is based? Okay, so uh, Nevis, are you asking about the research that was done uh, by Richard Davidson? Is that the question? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed um, the top here. Is that the question? Jean-Luc, yes. Ricard. 
Oh, because they conducted research. It's not because he's happy. They conducted research on his brain. They, they put him inside uh, an MRI, inside a machine, and um, they, uh, they checked his, uh, his emotions as he was there. He was meditating. And you can find out more about it. If you go online, you'll get the, uh, the information. Uh, it's not because he's smiling. But maybe there's someone else out there who is also very, very happy. But they would have to go through the research to find out. He had the highest results which just showed that meditation uh, helps learning. If you listen to Daniel Goleman, and we're going to listen just a little bit, uh, this is Daniel Goleman, and um, I'm going to share a YouTube video. This is the book, it's called Focus. I don't have the book with me, I just listened to, um, to the book. Um, I have to get, I think I, it's on its way, I'm not sure. In any case, uh, let me let me share the uh, the video. Not not all of it because it's long, but just a bit. Okay, so let me know when you start hearing it. Just let me know in the chat box. I'll mute my mic. Here we go. Finding and understanding what's going on with them, and then if they're in need and there's something that we can do, compassion and, and maybe helping them. But if we never notice in the first place, we never and this is the problem with attention today. It's under siege. I think the moment I knew we were in trouble was um, a while back before I started writing the book, Focus. I was uh, on my way to a meeting. I was driving. I live out in the country in New England. I, I was to know I was coming. So. As I was driving, I was texting them on okay, my I'm way. Okay, I'm going to, I just stopped it. That, that's rather horrible. To the video. Out, but what is I the point not, here? Uh, very long after Brian, that, you've been bringing us lots of, uh, the same as lots of links. What is the point here? It's really bad. That he's fact, trying to make about now. focus and the internet. Another thing I've noticed is when I was what writing What happens book, to our attention? I'd be kind of on a riff, really in flow, writing well. And then I'd have to look Were something up. Were you paying up. attention? So I go to Google Scholar. I love Google Scholar because it gives right. you access to the academic That's database. right. You get distracted. So you go from one thing browser, to the next, to the next, to the next. To the next. The, the in other words, you look up one thing and on I'm Google Scholar. Story. It takes so you somewhere sudden, else. And before you know it, stories, and before you've I know it, picked I've up a lot of information and you've gone, gone to different things, it's not really that, oh, eating up your time because up. you're learning. It's messy learning. That's what's happening. But you may be learning, but not what you intended to learn. In other words, it becomes incidental learning. You're learning all kinds of things, but you're off topic. But you're on topic because all this is relevant to you as a human being. Okay, but that's the situation and that's what focus is about. So you might like to uh, listen to it or uh, read the book. There's also a lot of information, I think, online where you can read part of the book if, um, if that interests you. So focus is an important part of learning. When we talk about learning, we talk about various levels of learning. If it's in school, the idea is to focus on whatever the course curriculum has laid out for the students and, of course, for the teacher. So it's teacher planned class not class-based, class-based, sorry about that, class-based uh, learning. Okay, get rid of this uh, here. Class-based learning. And what is it about? Okay, there are different levels. There's a level of knowledge, which you mentioned before, that's information. 
There's a level of understanding that was also mentioned in the chat box, but nobody mentioned, notice, you didn't mention these, and I'm wondering why. Why didn't you mention, let me make this a little bit thinner here, why didn't you mention analysis, synthesis, and application? Why didn't you mention these? You only mentioned knowledge and comprehension. Now, this isn't something bad. There, there has to be something, there has to be a reason for it. And it's not a right or wrong answer kind of uh, reason, okay? It's not that you were wrong. This is how you feel. This is how most of our students feel. They feel that learning is about information that is tangible, that we can measure, we can write it down, and they want to understand this information. And that's it. That's where they stop. That, that's where we test them. And that's why many of you, many of us, when we think of learning, we think of knowledge and understanding or comprehension. But it's so much more than that. Okay, and I've mentioned some of it. First of all, it's applying it. And I, oh, someone did, sorry, I take that back. Someone did talk about applying, am I right? Uh, someone, I think, uh, anyone re recall? I think I saw it here. Um, anyone? Um, or was I right? Okay, nobody mentioned application. But application is important, even though I think somebody did. It's applying the knowledge to a situation. It's using the information. Okay, Rachel, did you mention it? You did? All right, so application is something that we want. We feel that we want to be able to do something with the information. Otherwise, who needs it? Okay, why would I want to learn something if I can't apply it? So applying information is important. And it's something that I can measure. Okay, if I learn a skill, I can see if I can apply the skill or not. So that's something that we think about. But what about the rest? Analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And evaluation is the top. Okay, that's the highest level. And we're going to talk about other levels or stages as um, Maslow came up with a few years, well, 10 years before Bloom. Okay, 10 years before Bloom, Abraham Maslow came out with his ideas. Now, this is Bloom's taxonomy, which is a brilliant idea because we do need to think about this. But for some reason, we're still at the bottom. Okay, we're still focusing when we think about learning levels, we're still viewing students as, as what? What are we viewing students if we only focus on application, comprehension, and knowledge? What injustice are we doing here to our students? How do we view them? Or how, if you don't, you know, how does a teacher view his or her students, if they're only focusing on knowledge comprehension and application. Don't forget, our students are human. They're human beings, okay? They're not objects, and it's not about just measuring tangible things. It's about happiness, it's about enjoying yourself. It's about feeling. Okay, so the other things are maybe more important. Maybe they're more important. Who needs the lower ones? Why not focus on the higher learning levels or higher order thinking skills as they're called?
Why not? What would happen if we focused on the following? Well, I know that some schools would be very unhappy because how can you measure creating or evaluating? How can you measure someone's evaluation? Evaluating is something that could come from the heart. How do you measure that? It's how you feel. And it's not always based on, on science. Okay. And then the brain. Okay, again, back to mass. How what happens in the brain? According to Abraham Maslow, who um, came up with these ideas in 1950s, in the 50s, in the early and mid 50s, 10 years before uh, Bloom. Notice what he's focusing on. 1956. That's that's a million years ago. Where are we now? Are we moving? First of all, let's look at the levels. The lowest level is unconsciously. You're not really there. Your attention is not there. You're not focused. You're not aware of a skill you lack. You don't know what you need. Okay, you don't know. The next level, notice what happens. In the next level, you are aware that you lack a skill. All right, so. I need it. The next stage, you are consciously competent. You're actively working at a skill, although it requires a lot of thought, but you can do it. And the highest skill, and I want you to tell me what you think of here. The highest skill is unconsciously, trying to get a color here, unconsciously competent, but you are so skilled that you no longer have to even think about it. It's automatic. And these are stages of learning. You know you've learned something when you do it without thinking about it. It becomes part of you. It's you, which is a completely different way of how we look at things. We don't involve our students in the process of learning. And if you think of Dewey, it's all about the process. Where's the process? Where's happiness? What happened to being happy? Isn't that important? No, what we have is control. Okay, something that we can measure. So take a look at this bike. You've got the teacher. You've got the student, the student wheel, the teacher wheel, and they are moving together. Notice the student seats. Isn't this amazing? And they're driving. They're moving forward, two wheels, and yet they're sitting behind the teacher seat. So where are you? Is this you? Is this you? Okay, where are you and how are you moving in your classes? Are you moving with your students and paddling together? Or are you sitting in the front with your students behind you? In most schools, it's the teacher in the front and the students uh, in front of her or and what happens as a result? If you let your students do what they want, you'll get this. So how in the world are you going to allow your students to move with you together? Okay, it takes a lot of thought. Okay, and that's the reason why most teachers want peace and quiet. And the only way to get peace and quiet is to stand up and face your students and make sure that no one moves and that they are glued to their chairs. 
Where is creativity? That's right, Jane. Where is creativity? Where's anything? No creativity. Nothing. But what are you supposed to do? So a lot of teachers say, well, we have no choice. Is there any learning going on in the classroom? Probably not. Where do you think there's more learning? Just to be honest, top or bottom? Okay, top or bottom? Where do you think there's potentially more learning? <laughs> Nevis, you're saying top. I want to see you let your students do that and have the principal come in and see what he says or she says. Okay, so, all right. So are you uh, top, down, or down up? Okay, so what's happening here? Okay, so um, it's probably a combination, definitely a combination and a different layout. But look at the teacher here. Okay, I love that. Uh, okay, the teacher's not even there. Okay, so think of the bike and how to uh, move in the classroom. All right, just to uh, summarize, if you could just add in the chat box a couple of concepts, things that come to mind. Um, what are you going to take with you? Uh, what are some of the ideas? Just write them down that you're going to take with you. And maybe what ideas are you not going to take with you? That's even harder to answer. Okay, so what are you going to take and what are you not going to take? This is your chance to evaluate and be creative. So evaluate. Okay, that's the um, higher. You've heard uh, some information. You've experienced some things. Uh, now it's time to um, add your evaluation. So I see there's a very nice evaluation from Nevis with her tongue, at, with, with the smiley and the tongue out. I think that's a very creative way of what you've taken. Okay, so uh, feel free to use the chat box as things come up uh, with what you've taken. And let's go through the summary. So what you got... Don't worry, I'm not going to. Uh... First of all, you got the how. Okay, how uh, do we learn? Remember the science of learning. How do we learn? Why do we learn? Where do we learn? When do we learn? Okay, so can you answer those questions? Give me a thumbs up if you're able to answer those questions. Okay, how, why, where, and when. Okay, that makes it easier, right? Easier to uh, try to put things together. So let me help you do that. Okay, so first thing, you can read about research brain-based learning and see how we learn. What does research say about learning? And it does. There's a lot of information out there, especially by Richard Davidson, who's conducting amazing research. And then emotions and information, because it's not enough to get information. We need to feel. And if students think, Oh my gosh, this is boring. What are they going to feel? Boring. Remember, you think and you feel. So we have to make sure that what they're thinking is what we want them to think. In other words, we want them to be happy. We want them to have happy thoughts. Happy thoughts will make them happy. Sad thoughts will make them sad. Boring thoughts will make them bored. That's how it works. Think first, and then the emotions come. Okay, first we think, and then we feel. So we want them to be happy and have happy thoughts so that uh, they can learn. Next, oops, I did that too quickly. Next is order or chaos. What do you want in your classroom? You saw the two photos. Uh, do you want order or do you want chaos? I know what I want, but I don't think this, 
the college where I teach, well, they might. You know what? They don't really care. Um, so in, at a university or a college, I, I can basically uh, have chaos or order. Okay, that's next is school. Do you want things planned or incidental? What kind of learning do you want? Do you want to follow a very planned system, teach at school, and test whatever you decide? Or you also want to have incidental learning and learn with your students and then maybe uh, evaluate what they learned? And then we discussed levels and stages with Maslop for the uh, stages and Bloom for the levels of learning. Any questions? Any questions? We've got a few minutes here. I'd love to get past the mic around. Okay, something to think about. And here are the references. And I promised Tom I would give him the links in a minute. Uh, Davidson, okay, with uh, The Emotional Life of Your Brain. And then Goldman, Focus, The Hidden Drive of Excellence. Meyer, and Applying the Science of Learning. And Partnoy, with weight, the useful art of procrastination. And you can find these on YouTube if you want to listen to them. Uh, in addition, we discussed levels and stages. Maslow toward a psychology of being. Notice 2014. And Bloom, Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, Handbook 1, The Cognitive Domain, written in 1956, a long time ago, and we're still not applying his ideas, which is really a shame. Okay, so questions. I'd like to pass the mic around. As I said, I'm just going to stop the recording uh, for Camtasia, and I hope it doesn't crash. It's been crashing lately. <laughs>